this slideshow, we are going to present you the making of a piece entitled Liberté Moi, Freedom Me. It is one of the largest sculpture ever made in glass paste. We decided to use the throwaway wax technique so as to create the fireproof mold which will shape the 200 kilograms of crystal. A seven part plugging mold was realized on the primal plaster shape. Then, each of the seven parts was stamped with a brush. The elements were then positioned so as to recreate the original shape. A shell of plaster is made to maintain the hole together. The whole set is turned over so as to allow ending the stamping, the pouring of the wax mixed with rocks, and also to allow fixing it with wooden battens. The shell is shattered and the mold broken. The sculpture of mixed wax is bolted with the battens on a base made of wood, which in turn will become the bottom part of a formwork. This stage is necessary in order to avoid any movement while pouring the fireproof plaster. Once the wax has been fixed on a wooden base, a formwork is then built to cast the fireproof plaster. The shape of the formwork has been studied so as to optimize the physical resistance of the mold, the mass ratios during the thermal transfers, as well as the size of the kiln. In order to adjust the amount of fireproof plaster, the formwork is filled with silica. It is a simple yet efficient method. Some wax has been melted so as to coat the sides of the formwork. This part has two functions. First, to avoid the water contained in the plaster to soak up the mold. Then, to ease the unshattering to come. 350 kg of dry plaster and 80 kg of water are necessary to make up the mold. Because of physical resistance, the casting has to be made in one unique step. Hence, it requires a large human and material infrastructure. The surface is leveled so that the work will sit steadily in the kiln. Once the pouring is over, the formwork mold set is transferred under a hoist prior installed next to the kiln. Each movement has been thought of and requires precision. There cannot be any mistake. Many precautions are necessary to keep the mold in good shape. The slings are carefully positioned to lift up the 500 kilograms. A base is then positioned on one of the sides of the formwork to accompany the movement. It will then serve as a support during the unwaxing stage. The sides of the formwork are removed, the bottom is unbolted from the battens fixed in the wax. It is now possible to start unwaxing with a gas torch. The wax drips into a recipient the presence of ballasting rocks now becomes evident.
As I have just mentioned before, in order to adjust the exact amount of crystal necessary, the volume of the sculpture has been defined by filling it with silica. The hoist is repositioned to enable introducing the piece in the kiln. We decided to resort to U-shaped metal construction bars because of the strong thermal gradient we noticed thanks to measures of the temperature with cones and optical measures. This is further reinforced by the fact that there is no resistance on the ground. The two U-shaped metal bars serve different functions. First, to lift up the melt so as to favour air movement below the piece then to support the piece while introducing it into the kiln. Fireproof sheets set in between the U-shaped metal bars and the melt serve different purposes. At first, they have a physical function which is to distribute the forces of the U-shaped metal bars and the melt. Then they also have a thermal function which is to stabilize the shifts in temperature. Finally, they also serve as a means to ensure the size variations of the different elements. This is why both sides were coated in kaolin, that is to say, a lubricant. The mould was then positioned on the sheets. The bars were then used as a support for the slings. The wood sheet protected the mould and served as a guide for the slings in order to avoid the bars to be moving during the lifting and shifting operations. The slings had to be carefully set so that the mould would sit in a perfect horizontal position. A second chain hoist allowed us to move the piece horizontally and to set it above the kiln. Putting the piece in the kiln was a long and strenuous operation. A whole day was dedicated to it because the dimensions of the kiln were not conformed to the informations given before. To compensate the thermal gradient due to the kiln and the shape of the sculpture, some heavy bricks are laid in different spots. This operation allowed us to gain a certain homogeneity through inertia. Once the mould was positioned, it has been filled with crystal balls. Its density is 3.6 and is made up of 30% lead. The kiln is closed, the slow rise in temperature is imposed by the drying of the mould, 80 litres of water having to evaporate. This is why the vents at the bottom of the kiln have been opened. It was necessary to add 50 kilograms of crystal to complete the piece. As we opened the kiln, we noticed there was an important break in one of the sides of the mould. It was located around the pelvis of the figure. Once we finished adding up crystal, we decided to leave the kiln open to rapidly lower the temperature so as to congeal the mass of crystal. This is the reason why some balls did not fully fuse. Thus, only about 2 kg of matter ran out of the mould. Fortunately, for safety reason, the ground had been covered with silica before we put the mould in the kiln. A slick of ceramic was then set on the sculpture, which by then reached about 500 to 600 Celsius degrees. The flaws are undoubtedly due to a lack of attention at the facility, which caused the power to be cut twice. These things unfortunately sometimes happen. Despite these events, our decisions managed to bring to a good end the project. The kiln, closed again, resumed the firing process. 
Five months and a half lapsed between us putting the piece in the kiln and taking it out. Once the piece was out, I polished the inferior side of it. After a 500 kilometers trip back to its birthplace, the part jutting out was sculpted with diamond tools for about 5 centimeters so as to give it back its original shape. A metal pedestal priorly realized was glued to the sculpture. The month-long final stage included, on the one side, a hand sanding and hand polishing face which gave the sculpture its incomparable silky finish, on the other side, fixing the chains. The polishing on the inferior side of the sculpture allows the sculptor to lift through the lights and thus to smoothly